Okay, so after a few requests, I think it's appropriate to actually release the Vanillin Oxine video. This video has actually been sitting on my hard drive for a while, and I guess it's time for it to be released. The major reason why I didn't release it is because the Vanillin Oxime is supposed to serve as a precursor for something called Vanillyl Amine. This Vanillyl Amine is a precursor to make spicy compounds and capsaicinoids like capsaicin. The biggest reason why I didn't release this video is because even though the Vanillin Oxime was possible to synthesize, I had a problem with the follow-up reaction. I've tried three different distinct methods all twice and the resulting product wasn't vanillyl amine. So right now I'm still working on a decent synthesis of the vanillyl amine and I hope that it comes from vanillin oxime, but it might not. Anyway, no matter what happens, I still think that the synthesis of vanillyl oxime is interesting and it has merits on its own, even if it's not used in further synthesis. Anyway, to start with the real introduction, I'll start to answer the question, which is what is an oxime? In very simple terms, an oxime is a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen and then with an OH group attached to the nitrogen. The oxime is generated from functional groups known as ketones or aldehydes. These are basically just a carbon double bonded with an O and depending on the substituents that are attached to the carbon, if there's two, it'll be a ketone and if there's just one and a hydrogen, it'll be an aldehyde. In the case of vanillin, I've highlighted in red the aldehyde, and we're going to convert this to the oxime. The reason for converting it to the oxime is because the oxime is able to do different chemical reactions. The oxime has some pretty cool and niche applications, and I won't get into these now, but what we planned to do was convert the N and the OH to just an NH2. This reaction is known as a reduction, and once this is done, we would have the final product of vanillyl amine. Like I said though, I've tried several different methods and none of them seem to work as advertised, but I'm still working on it and I think I'll get it eventually. Anyway, that's it for now, but I will end up touching on oxymes in a future video when I talk about nylon synthesis. So these are all the chemicals that are needed to carry out this synthesis. So we're going to need some vanillin, some sodium acetate, and some hydroxylamine hydrochloride. The sodium acetate that I used was anhydrous, which means water-free, but the easier to obtain one is sodium acetate trihydrate, and this can be used as well. The only thing is that if you use the trihydrate, you're going to have to do a little bit of math to find out how much you'll need. The vanillin that I used was purchased from AliExpress, but you can also use vanillin that was extracted from vanilla sugar like I showed in a previous video. In the future, I do plan to make a video on how to get sodium acetate and how to make hydroxylamine hydrochloride. Making the sodium acetate is pretty easy and it just involves mixing vinegar and baking soda, but the hydroxylamine hydrochloride is a little bit more involved. Anyway, I used 5 grams of hydroxylamine hydrochloride, 9.8 grams of vanillin, and 10.55 grams of anhydrous sodium acetate. The order of the addition really doesn't matter, but I started out by adding the 5 grams of hydroxylamine hydrochloride. The next thing that I added was the 10.55 grams of anhydrous sodium acetate. On top of these two powders, I poured in 90 milliliters of distilled water. I place a stirring plate below the round bottom flask and I add in a magnetic stirrer and then I stir until everything is dissolved. The water will slowly clear up as everything dissolves and eventually we'll be left with a crystal clear solution. To this solution, we dump in the 9.8 grams of vanillin. I start to stir the solution, but it's going to become opaque because vanillin isn't very soluble in water. The round bottom flask is placed in an oil bath and above is attached a water condenser. We then turn on the hot plate to heat up the oil and bring a reaction to a boil. As the mixture starts to heat up, the solubility of vanillin in the water will increase and eventually we'll be left with a clear solution. Once the solution is brought to a boil, we will obtain what's known as a reflux. The water will be boiling off, but the water vapor will be recondensed by the condenser that we have above. This way we can heat the reaction to boiling without losing any of the water. By heating up the reaction, we're greatly increasing the rate of the reaction. Not only does heating things up generally increase reaction rates, but we're also getting the vanillin to dissolve into solution. 
With the increased reaction rate due to the heat and with the vanillin actually dissolving into solution, we run this reflux for 20 minutes and the reaction should be done. If the reaction wasn't heated, we'd be probably left with a mess of vanillin mixed with vanillin oxime and it would probably take hours or days to even get close to completion. Anyway, now we'll address what's actually going on in the reaction. The vanillin reacts with the hydroxylamine hydrochloride to form vanillin oxime, hydrochloric acid, and water. One thing to note is that the HCl isn't really produced and it's kind of just released by the hydroxylamine hydrochloride. I purposely didn't include the sodium acetate in the reaction so I can make things more clear as to exactly what it's doing. Also, the reaction mechanism is pretty simple, so I'll actually go over it. First of all, I'll address what the sodium acetate's doing, and it's really not actually participating in the reaction. The sodium acetate is present in order to sequester the hydrochloric acid and form acetic acid instead. The reason for this is that strong mineral acids like hydrochloric acid can react with our oxime and wreck it. The addition of the sodium acetate will make an acidic buffer solution. I won't really go into the details on exactly how a buffer solution works, but it basically resists pH change. In the case of sodium acetate, it will react with free hydrogen ions from the hydrochloric acid and it will sequester it into acetic acid. Acetic acid is a weak acid and it likes to hold on to its hydrogens, so it pretty much just picks up the extra hydrogens that form, sequesters it into acetic acid and prevents the pH from decreasing. This way the pH remains more or less fixed during the reaction and we don't have strong hydrochloric acid floating around. When we combine these two separate reactions together, we get our final equation. After all this talk about buffer solutions, I should note that we could just flat out add a base and neutralize the hydrochloric acid. This procedure called for sodium acetate, but there are other procedures that call for the use of the base sodium hydroxide instead. Okay, so now to move on to the mechanism, and I don't really want to go into too much detail, but I'll give the general overview. So you can see here, highlighted in red, is the aldehyde of the vanillin. The most important aspect of the aldehyde is the carbon-oxygen double bond. Oxygen is a lot more electronegative than carbon, and it likes to pull and hold onto electrons a lot more. The oxygen and carbon are covalently bound, which means they share electrons. In a perfectly fair and equal world, the electrons would be held exactly in the middle between the oxygen and the carbon. However, like I said, oxygen's greedier, and it really likes to pull the electrons more, so the electrons will lie much closer to the oxygen than the carbon. This has the effect that the carbon is very slightly electron deficient, which means that it has less of a negative charge influence on it, so it gives the carbon a slight positive charge. The slight positive charge is denoted by the delta positive next to the carbon. Now we'll move over to the hydroxylamine, and it's a lot simpler. The nitrogen basically has a lone pair of electrons that would like to be shared with something. This something is generally something that carries a positive charge or a partial positive, and in our case, we have our aldehyde. So what's going to happen is the lone pair of the nitrogen is going to attack the partial positive of the carbon in the aldehyde and form a bond. This forms an intermediate where one hydrogen from the nitrogen and one from the acid is transferred to the oxygen. The oxygens are not directly transferred from nitrogen or acetic acid, and water actually acts as the intermediate. This turns the oxygen into a water molecule, and it's pretty stable on its own and really wants to leave. To initiate this, a free lone pair of the nitrogen forms a double bond with the carbon, and the water is kicked off. The H on the nitrogen is picked up by water to regenerate the acid. This forms our final vanillin oxime product with water as a byproduct. It's also important to note that although we can't form our oxime in strongly acidic mediums, we do need acid to catalyze this reaction. The intermediate for the proton transfer is water, so it bounces between H2O and H3O, and for this to happen it has to be in at least a slightly acidic medium. I did mention earlier that instead of sodium acetate, we could use sodium hydroxide to make the solution extremely basic. 
In this case, water would still be the intermediate proton carrier, but instead of bouncing between H2O and H3O, it would bounce between OH- and H2O. Also, if we're working with sodium hydroxide, we're not going to be converting hydrochloric acid to a weaker acid, we're going to simply be neutralizing it. Anyway, that was pretty long-winded and a lot more information than I thought I was going to give. After the 20 minutes has passed, it's removed from the oil bath and allowed to cool to room temperature. We allow the solution to cool slowly, and as it cools, some crystals will form at the bottom. As time passes, more and more crystals form. After the solution has reached room temperature, there's quite a few crystals. To precipitate as much as possible, the solution is placed in the freezer for several minutes. Afterwards, the crystals are separated out by vacuum filtration. The entire contents of the round bottom flask is poured into the Buchner funnel and then a vacuum is pulled. A little bit of ice cold water is used to wash the round bottom flask a few times and this is also added to the Buchner funnel. Also, just to really clean things up, a couple ice cold water washings are carried out. After the final washing, the vacuum is pulled for several minutes to dry our product. The contents of the Buchner funnel are then dumped onto a white piece of paper. You can see here that we have some fairly nice, slightly off-white crystals of vanillin oxime. The final yield of vanillin oxime is 8.85 grams, which represents a percent yield of about 82%. The vanillin crystals are then transferred to a small bottle for storage. Like I said, I do plan to use this and make vanillin amine out of it, but up until now, I haven't had any luck. As a bonus, I'll leave you with a short clip of me pouring concentrated sulfuric acid onto my hand. Don't worry, my hand is perfectly fine, and I'll post a video in the future explaining exactly why I did this. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, instead of stockpiling videos, I've decided I'm going to publish them as soon as I edit them, so in the next month or so, there's going to be a lot of videos coming out. On my Patreon, I also added a milestone, and if we get to $250 per video, I'll commit to doing videos for at least six months.